All right. I believe we are live. Welcome to the Neurosurgery Journey podcast. Uh, this is a podcast hosted by Brain and Spine Group. And today I'm joined by Gretchen in the bottom right. And we also have a special guest here in the top right, Dr. Michael Bamamore, uh, who is a PGY1 neurosurgery resident at Cooper University in Camden, New Jersey. So as you see by the title of tonight's um, podcast, it is the osteopathic journey to neurosurgery. So the main question is, is, is it possible to become a neurosurgeon as an osteopathic or a DO medical student? Um, this is a question commonly posed by many pre-med and medical students. Uh, we have a large following of osteopathic medical students in BSG. There are also a lot of college students that are applying to DO schools. Um, and one of the goals of the Neurosurgery Journey podcast is to highlight these many different routes that can be taken to achieve a career in neurosurgery. So aside from the foundational tenets in this pursuit, DO students have additional matters to consider in their pursuit of neurosurgery. So we're going to attempt to break down the pursuit of neurosurgery as DO students and uh, a doctor of osteopathic medicine with us. Um, and the advice and insights that we're going to present will aim to help other students pursue this path and ultimately increase the interest in neurosurgery um, amongst future and current DO students and enhance kind of the much needed uh, diversity amongst the current neuro neurosurgery workforce. So like I said, today we are joined by Dr. Michael Bamamore, and he is our guest from Cooper University in Camden, New Jersey. So my first question to you, Dr. Bamamore, and this is kind of one that we cover for everyone that comes here. So why did you choose to pursue a career in neurosurgery? Yeah, thanks for that question. That's a very nice question. I've gotten asked that many times. Um, I think um, for me, it came down to where I was from. So I, I was born in Nigeria and uh, back there, I had a lot of opportunities to see my grandmother at a uh, maternity hospital. So I got some opportunity to see what medicine was like uh, in the third world country. Um, but uh, she had a subdural hematoma after a car accident. And one of the things that we noticed at the time was that there was a, a lot of problem finding neurosurgeons to operate on her. And even when we did find someone, there wasn't an electricity to actually power the OR to operate on her. Uh, we were very lucky that there was an American neurosurgeon around um, who was able to uh, save her life. So I think for me, that was like the first encounter that I ever had um, with neurosurgery as a profession. Um, and then later on along the way, I read a couple of books. Um, and I think it was just inspiring just to see what it would be like to come from a place that I came from and then to, I, I guess, climb the neurosurgery tree. So uh, when I came to the US, I just made up my mind. I was like, I want to be a neurosurgeon. I don't care what happens. And I guess you know, here we are. So. Wow, that's a that's an incredible story, uh, Dr. Bamamore. That's uh, very inspiring, and I'm sure that that experience has, has fueled your passion and has made you extremely successful so far, and uh, will definitely lead you to even more success, uh, you know, down the road. So, kind of, you know, um, looking at our our college or our pre med uh, students that are interested in this route. So, what really led you to wanting to apply apply to osteopathic medical school. Was there anything that attracted you to, um, you know, the osteopathic ideas? Like what, what made you want to apply? Yeah. Funny enough, I actually didn't know that osteopathic medical schools existed until the year that I was applying to medical school. Um, throughout college, I just knew, okay, my goal was to get into medical school. I just knew, okay, I wanted to get into an MD school, I suppose. Um, but uh, I think the summer before I applied, uh, one of the alumni at my school, my college, Rutgers Camden, um, uh, Dr. Tilton at the time uh, approached me and said, you know, you're trying to apply to medical school now. You know, do you know what kind of school you want to go to? And then he brought up the idea of DO, a DO school. I was like, well, you know, what is that? And he kind of explained to me, he actually ended up going to my alma mater, uh, PCOM. Um, so he encouraged me to actually just apply and see what happens. 
Uh, and he explained the ideals of the osteopathic philosophy to me. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to do neurosurgery also was so I can go back to Africa at some point, you know, to Nigeria to help out because there's a lot of neurosurgical disparities there. Um, so I, the osteopathic philosophy really, um, uh, I was attracted to it uh, because I felt like, you know, you're able to see the patient as a whole uh, from a holistic point of view. And I felt like I'd be able to help my patients back home uh, a lot better. Um, so, I mean, I applied to medical school. I, you know, got interviews and um, I got into PCOM. Um, I got into a couple of other schools too, but I felt that PCOM uh, had a neurosurgery program and I felt that it was the straightest shot for me to get to where I needed to get to. Uh, so I just knew if I worked hard and then I just, I'll get there. Uh, but it was, it's definitely hard, but like still, thankfully you know, it worked, so. Yeah, absolutely. And then I want to turn it over to, to Gretchen too, because Gretchen, you're also a uh, osteopathic medical student. So why did you pursue the DO route? Yeah, um, so kind of similar as far as I didn't really know DO was around, that it existed. Um, again, until I started applying to medical school and someone also brought up the idea, idea to me like, oh, have you considered um, applying to DO programs? I was like, DO, what's that? And I looked into it and I was like, yeah, this seems great. And so I applied and got some interviews and ended up deciding to go to KCU. Um, it kind of mainly came down to on the interview day, talking to some of the students and talking to their experiences in OMM lab and how they were able to apply OMM on their clinical rotations. And I just like the idea of having that extra knowledge that I could use to help my patients rather than just prescribing medications or sending them somewhere else for physical therapy or something like that. Um, so that's kind of kind of the uh, decision path that I took. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, for, you know, for those of you listening that don't uh, really know what the, I mean, there's really the fundamental difference between MDs and DOs is that DOs have an extra training in osteopathic manipulative medicine and treat and treatment, which allows you to use your hands and kind of work with the muscles, the tissues, the tendons and ligaments in order to treat patients without medications, like you said. And that's really the, the, the main difference aside outside of that and, and kind of their holistic approach, there really aren't a lot of differences um, between MDs and DOs, even though there seems to be a lot of talk sometimes in the news about differences between them, but really we're, we're just the same people. We just want to, you know, become doctors and physicians and, and, and help people. Um, but it, there are some, you know, some, and, th and that's kind of my journey too, as well. I applied to both MD and DO schools. I was more interested in just becoming a physician. Um, I go to Kentucky college of osteopathic medicine in Pikeville, Kentucky, and my interview day just kind of really fit well with who I was and my values. And I just had a really good experience there. And I said, yeah, this is, this is definitely the place I want to go. So that's kind of my, my reasoning for, for pursuing, uh, you know, a, a, a DO school, but you know, there are considerations, um, that need to be, you know, taken when you apply to a DO school, especially in the pursuit of neurosurgery. Um, so I guess Dr. Bamamore, you know, looking back, if you were to tell yourself, you know, as a college student, uh, you know, some things to consider before applying to a DO school or just medical school in general, if you're wanting to pursue neurosurgery, what are some things that you would tell yourself at that time? Um, I think at the end of the day, I think looking back at the end of the day comes down to, I would tell my younger, uh, my younger self that it comes down to you. Um, at the end of the day, if you're trying to go to a DO school to become a neurosurgeon, um, I don't think, you know, you have to, I think a lot of the other counterparts like MD schools, when you go to those schools, um, to a certain extent, you still have to depend on you, but you still have, you have the, 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 the school to back you up in terms of research infrastructure, um, alumni infrastructure, um, good historical background for like neurosurgery. Some of them have like neurosurgery programs. Um, but going to a DO school, especially one that doesn't have a neurosurgery program, then you have to really rely on yourself and how much you're willing to work, um, not only academically, but also socially, because you have to build a network. Um, and that means going to conferences, that means putting yourself out there, 
um, when otherwise you might not feel like you want to. Um, so I would, if I had to give myself an advice, I would, I would say it comes down to you, uh, how much you're willing to work for it. And you can't depend on the school you go to. Not that the schools won't help you, but you have to be, uh, you have to be the driver of your own fate. If that's a better way to say it. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that, you know, you've experienced that and, and I've experienced that and Gretchen's experienced that too. You have to be the, like you said, the driver of your own fate. You have to be the one putting in a little bit of work. Um, and, you know, this is a, you know, I'll ask Gretchen this question. So the same question, you know, looking back, you're now at third year, you're going to be a fourth year medical student. You're on the tail end of your research here. You know, looking back, applying to medical school and, you know, being at Yale, what would you say, like, what is some advice you would give, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, an undergraduate student that's wanting to pursue a DO school? What is some advice you would give? Yeah, for sure. Um, so first, I'll just kind of start with um, the general advice I give any uh, undergrad that's thinking about medical school and sort of along the same lines of what Dr. Bama Moore was starting to say and that, you um, your environment can very much influence, you know, the path that you take or the one that you choose to take, um, how easy or accessible certain faculty or departments are. Um, and so a big, a big thing is to think about whether or not that school has an affiliated hospital, whether that's not even neurosurgery, but just clinically any exposure at all. Um, that's usually my first bit of advice. Um, and then I kind of go into what Dr. Bam Moore so eloquently explained and that um, if you don't have that at your disposal, um, you definitely have to put in more legwork on your own and really, again, be the driver of your own force. Um, that's a big thing to think about. And some things that I know I didn't think about when I was applying to medical school, I just thought, I just wanna get into medical school. I just wanna be a doctor and that's that. Um, but it is a big factor to consider. Um, so that would be the main one. And then um, as far as MD versus DO, which is some questions I've gotten from students, um, kind of just comes down to their philosophy and how they approach or how they think they want to approach patient care. Um, I think the DO, uh, the DO background is definitely a little bit more holistic in looking at the entire patient, their history, um, things that they just may be physically capable to do. Um, and not that DO schools or MD counterpoints don't learn the same thing, but um, I feel like you embody that a little bit more um, through osteopathic practice. So that's something else that I tell them to think about is how important is that to you? And is it something that you think you'll just learn and dump or is it something that you'll actually um, embody and like take with you into clinical practice? Yeah, it's such a such a great answer, Gretchen. And I, I, I agree, too. I think that, you know, it's a huge consideration to make. Uh, and like Dr. Bamamore said, too, is when you're, you know, when you're looking at these schools that you're applying to, you need to be aware of the already established infrastructure, um, because that can sometimes make or break your pursuit of very competitive specialties as a DO. You know, a Dr. Bamamore went to Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine where they have a neurosurgery residency, which is now at Cooper uh, University, but it was already established. There was mentorship available. There were research opportunities. There were, you know, abilities and ways to get into the ORs as a first year. And sometimes, you know, sometimes DO schools, which is, and it's absolutely fine. Some of them just don't have the infrastructure available to handle this. So I would, you know, recommend that if you're gung ho on neurosurgery and you're applying to DO schools, I would, you know, take a look at their website, ask if they've matched students into neurosurgery in the recent past, you know, 10 years ago, matching a neurosurgeon is a night and day difference between, you know, today's applicants and today's people that are pursuing it. So that's what I would recommend. Um, it might be that you have to jump through some hoops, uh, you know, a little bit more if you don't have a home program. Um, but it definitely, definitely doesn't mean that you uh, won't and can't get there as Dr. Bama Moore is a perfect example of that. And so just to, I guess, you know, the kind of transition into, so, you know, those are the considerations if you're, you know, pre-med student looking at DO schools, let's say you get into, you know, your, your, your DO school of choice, 
you're waiting, you know, you're starting medical school. And, and I, just to kind of give an overview, uh, you know, I want to ask Dr. Dr. Bama more about his journey from, you know, first day of M1 to residency. If you could just give me kind of a brief or if it's a long one, that's absolutely fine. Just give me kind of a story of things that you did, um, you know, from day one to, to, you know, starting your first day of intern year to kind of make yourself competitive to get into neurosurgery. Yeah. Uh, so I went into med school knowing I wanted to be a neurosurgeon, right? So I think one of the things that I started thinking about was how hard it was going to be as a DO to get into neurosurgery compared to my MD counterparts. Um, I knew I already was at a medical school that added neurosurgery program. So it came down to how do I then start building relationships to, even if I don't end up getting to go to that program, but at least to build relationships that could help me to get into other programs or anything. So I started shadowing my school's program. I think it was like the November of my first year as a medical student. So I would go in, I would just pick a day out of the week that I didn't have like important classes. And I would go in at like maybe 5, 45, 6 a.m. in the morning. And I'd stay with them, go, go to the OR, probably leave like around 7 p.m. at night. So I, I would do that every once in a while, just to start building connections. And so that way they, you know, they start to know who I am. So that was like my first game plan. And then second was, okay, well, I have to do well in school as well. Um, so, you know, you have to really, really get down to it and try to do the best that you can academically. Um, and then you, you have to think about research. So how do you best find research opportunities? It's not easy to find, um, especially when you're just starting out. I mean, I had some research experience in college, but it's a whole different ball game if you're trying to get into uh, neurosurgery because then you have to go into the, you're not just trying to get posters anymore or some abstracts published, you're trying to get actual papers in, and it's very hard to find opportunities for people that want to put in their papers. Um, so I just did what I could find. Um, but as time went on, I think it just came down to my persistence. So by the time third year came around, I was like, okay, well, what are the things that I need to do to set myself up for success in my fourth year? So I decided not to do rotations that was around the Philly area. I wanted to go as far as and as broad as I possibly can to meet as many people as I can. One thing I always tell people is you never know who uh, people are. So it doesn't matter if you're on your family medicine rotation or your OMM rotation or your ob rotation. Still be on, always be in best behavior because then I've always found favor in the places that I didn't even think I would find favor at. So, um, so you know, I did a rotation in Allegheny General in Pittsburgh for a month. Uh, went to Redmond to do a neurocortical care rotation. All those little things, I got to meet people at different places. Uh, so by the time I got to my fourth year, you know, I was able to do all the other rotations as well. Unfortunately, I didn't match the first time I applied. But it was all a accumulation of trying to be to put myself in the best position possible, um, which all ended up landing me at Mayo, where I did my research here. And then, you know, luckily, I wouldn't say luckily, but through hard work, getting into residency today. So I don't know. It's I wouldn't say that it was planned. I think it was just a lot of just trying uh, and just doing the leg work, leg work. So. It's hard to plan that. So. It is hard to plan that, but you just kept saying it over and over again. It's the key word. It's persistence. You didn't exactly. give up. You were, you know, the first one in to the ORs. You were the last one to leave. You showed your interest. You were kind to everyone and just doing that every single day over and over and over again. And there, you know, your answer had a lot of great, you know, topics that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, and, I, you know, I appreciate the honesty and everything. But let's first talk about, you know, everyone knows that you have to get good grades. You have to do well on your board exams. You have to do the, the academic stuff. But let's, you know, I'm a, I'll am i keep it on, on you, Dr. Bama more, and then I'll move over to Gretchen. How did you approach obtaining research opportunities as a osteopathic medical student in a field like neurosurgery? How did how did you approach that? Um, I remember I, I tried to find opportunities at different areas. I think one of the places I went to was Penn. I tried to do uh, basic science research over there. 
but it's really hard to get that started. That kind of fell off. Um, and then I, you know, did some projects with some of the residents at my uh, school's institution. Um, those, you know, went well, got some experience. Uh, but to be honest, I actually didn't really get a lot of research experience until after I didn't match. Um, I had done a rotation at Mayo the year that I was applying, and I, you know, I think I did pretty well at the rotation. I was able to, uh, I guess, uh, find um, really good mentors that really cared about my future. So when I didn't match, you know, I, I just reached out to them and I said, you know, um, I didn't match. I'm still interested in neurosurgery. Can I do a research here um, at your institution? And that will help me to be more competitive the following year. So, and they were so happy to have me. Um, so fast, quickly, actually very fast that by the next month I was in Florida uh, living there. Um, so my goal was that I wanted to do as much as I can with as little time as I could. Because when you're reapplying again, you only have about six or seven months to change your resume essentially um, before applying again. So um, I just worked as hard as I can. So I think, again, it just comes back to the back point again, just persistence, grit, um, callous in your mind. That's a saying that I like to say. So. I like that callous in your mind. I usually go to the gym and get callous on my hands, but I, I need to start developing calluses on my on my brain. So yeah. I will continue to work on that. That's great. So yeah, I'll move over to you, Gretchen. So you know these research years keep popping up, which seem to be kind of the 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 highly suggested thing for a lot of students, including DO students. But kind of tell me, you know, your experience in getting involved in uh, research as a DO student. Yeah, sure. Um, so to kind of start out, so I had a little bit of research experience prior to medical school. Um, so I kind of had an idea of just what research entailed. Um, but then a little bit of just serendipity happened. Uh, the end of my first year, uh, Michael Quartz, who actually started this podcast a few last year, two years ago, um, he started the uh, this virtual research group called NERVE. And um, reached out, asked if anyone would be interested. And I was like, okay, yeah, like, let's do it. Um, I'm thinking neurosurgery at this point. Um, didn't really know too much about it or just how, I mean, kind of naively, just how hard it was for students to match. Um, so yeah, a lot of serendipity there. Um, so that's how I got started in medical school anyway. I'm just working on projects here and there um, with uh, students in the group, residents. And then um, as I got to know people more and more and um, kind of talked to them about their path towards, you know, applying and things that I should start thinking about, um, the idea of a research year came up, which I had never heard of. I thought you went to med school four years, you're done, that's it. <laughs> and um, I didn't even know you could take time off to do other things. So um, the idea of taking a year off from medical school to either do um, a full year totally dedicated to research, whether that's at your own institution or an outside institution, um, I didn't even know that was a thing. So the closer I got to my clinical years and then trying to decide if I wanted to move on to fourth year or take one of these research years, I talked to some people, um, some mentors, and um, realized that um, neurosurgery is a pretty research heavy field. I mean, there's a lot we don't know about the brain and the nervous system still. Um, so people are really excited to get stuff out there and learn more about it. Um, so I thought, okay, it's probably, we're going to do this research year thing, whatever that looks like, and still not a hundred percent knowing like what was in store for me. Um, but decided to do that. And I mean, so uh, Kansas City University, which is where um, I attend medical school, we don't have a home program, we don't have a residency program or anything like that. Um, so I started reaching out to programs around the area that um, I that had faculty whose research I was interested in, um, and just projects that I kind of had in the back of my mind, which I thought might align with their interests as well. And um, just kind of cold email. And <laughs> Uh, kind of like what uh, Dr. Barrymore said, I mean, I got a lot of eager responses very quickly. 
and that um, faculty in places are always excited to have students um, come conduct research with them. And uh, so that's kind of how it worked for me. I reached out to a program that I was really interested in and um, they said yes. And that set up a Zoom meeting with a PI and then the rest was history. So I've been there now this year and uh, starting to wind down a little bit, but still a lot of work to, uh, to be done before fourth year <laughs> turns around. Yeah, absolutely. I I I love the uh, the the cold emailing. I am a uh, a, a, a supporter of that. Uh, that's how I've gotten a, a couple of my research opportunities through medical school so far. Was essentially just sending emails to a lot of people and uh, saying, "Hey, I'd love to work on projects." I remember between my my uh, first and second year, I actually was uh, looking for a research internship uh, to go do and be productive between first and second year. And um, I sent a lot of cold emails to a lot of program coordinators, a lot of program directors, and really didn't have a lot of interest garnered except one, um, you know, one person emailed me back from the University of Kentucky. And he said, you know, one of the main reasons why I looked at your application wasn't your interest or anything like that. But I saw in there, you worked as a janitor. And I said, well, yeah. And he's like, I used to work as a janitor. So I guess and that kind of garnered this relationship. And I was able to do a cool research, you know, internship for a summer, but I've also gotten opportunities through Instagram. My first published paper was a connection through Instagram, uh, Twitter, things like that. So uh, like everyone has said to on here, it's, it's, you know, I know it can be difficult to kind of put yourself out there. Um, because, you know, you're going to be met with a lot of no's or a lot of, you know, just no answers, but, you know, you're going to have to do that if you don't have that at your program, but you never know kind of what connections are going to be made when you do those things. And they can lead that to research years. They can lead to mentorship. They can lead to a lot of incredible opportunities. So that's, that's, a, that's great. And then kind of just transitioning from, you know, the research side of things, uh, you know, mentorship. Uh, mentors are critical in obtaining neurosurgery residencies, and I think are even more critical as a, as a Catholic applicant. So, you know, my question to you, Dr. Bama Moore, is how did you obtain, you know, quality mentorship going through, uh, you know, medical school? Yeah. Um, it's a really good question. I think. Um, Honestly, it started with just starting at my own school's institution, just learning how to uh, uh, network uh, with the faculty. Um, and then I guess when I started my research here also, uh, my, my, my PI um, ended up actually being a very good mentor to me. Um, I, th I thought that in other words, you have to ask for someone to be your mentor. But I think uh, finding a mentor comes down to a two-way street. So you have to also try to contribute to that relationship as you want them to contribute to your relationship. So it's a, it's a give and take in a way. Um, so I think you know, it's kind of hard to say. Yeah, I think for me, uh, the mentorship opportunities that I had was actually just due to the work that I did. So it was almost like a two way street. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a great answer because it's very, you know, when you're looking for mentorships, you just don't want to go to a very busy neurosurgeon and be like, I want you to mentor me and right. then just walk out the door. You know, they want people who are excited about neurosurgery. They want people who show that they work hard. They want all those yeah. things and 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 like um showing initiative showing initiative showing that you not only did your own work um you know what you're here to get and you know how to get there and you bring 90 percent of the work already done and then you want your mentor to just add a little bit of extra to it so for example say that you're asking your mentor about a potential research opportunity um, you should be expected to have already done most of the work. And essentially what you want to do is, okay, this is what I have. I just want you to look at it and tell me what you think. Um, 
now the mentor's job is then to then look at what you've done and then point you in the right direction, um, essentially. Um, so I think it, you're doing most of the work, but the, the mentor's job is to then bless your work by point, putting you in the right direction and putting you in touch with the right people to then make that valuable. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that is such a critical point in in a mentor a mentee mentor relationship at, at this stage is it's not just you know at some point you might not know a lot about neurosurgery and that's fine. Your your PI is going to help you with projects. They're going to give you these ideas. But the goal is is as you progress, you should be coming to them with the ideas. You should be reading the literature and saying, "Hey, I read in this article that they are looking to do this. Why don't we do this as a project?" And then you give them the rough draft. You give them these things because that shows your growth as a researcher. And like Dr. Bamamore said, also shows your initiative. People love initiative. You have to be a go-getter. And when people see that, it's it's a very attractive quality in a mentee to a mentor. Um, and I just want to pose this question here from from John in the chat. Um, you know, he says the average neurosurgery match has 30 plus presentations, pu projects, publications, posters, all this stuff. So what what's the reality behind this number and, and how is this possible? And, and, and feel free, any of you to jump in on this one, because this is, is, is an important question to answer. Um, I think. Uh, so. Yeah, the, the reality is that that's the reality, right? Uh, but I think there's an emphasis so much these days on quantity than quality, uh, where we're just trying to get as much as we can, but not so much the best that we can. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know if it's going to change in the near future, but I know that, uh, you know, if I'm looking at someone, I'm trying to see, okay, yeah, you did all of this work, but how much do you actually know about all the stuff that you've done? Um, so, I, you know, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's, uh, I think it's quantity has been rewarded a lot more these days when it comes to these things. And I don't think they should carry as much weight as they do because, I don't know, it just becomes a, a war who has more. So just my perspective of it. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, getting those, you know, the numbers are there, they're, they're obviously there. But like you said, you know, you can tell someone, you know, when when they their name's been thrown on a project, that they don't, you know, necessarily know the research very well, you don't have to know every single little detail, but you need to know if you're an author on a paper, you need to know what's going on with it. Um, and, you know, my my advice for that is, is just always be hungry for projects, always be looking, you know, if you're, it, it, it goes back to that network thing, that cold emailing thing, you know, make sure you're, you're established in your schoolwork and your preclinical courses so that you're not, you know, doing poorly there and, and with your boards, but reach out to people via social media, you know, have some skills that you're good at, whether it's biostats, I can't tell you how valuable a, bio, a biostatistician is to research groups, you will accumulate so many projects, you want to know what to do with them if you have those skills. Um, systematic reviews, meta-analyses, getting these opportunities will keep the influx of projects available to you. And then it, it's up to you to be able to do the work and, you know, keep yourself organized and, you know, your production will be there and then submitting those to conferences and things of that nature will, after four years or even five years, if you choose a research year, uh, you know, it will put you in a good uh, seat to, you know, be competitive for the match. Yeah, yeah and Taylor, I just kind of want to add um, what, whereas, yes, that 30 plus uh, number is reality, as Dr. Bremen Moore said, but I think it's also important to not, as hard as it is, try not to get too caught up in the rat race of the publications for applications because uh, people, people looking at your application can tell if, well, you're fifth author on all of these publications. Whereas if you have, you know, five to 10 that you're either first, second, even third author on, like that's going to look very good on your part and it'll show that you've put in the work, you know what research looks like and what it takes to take a project from start to finish. And um, that's very valuable and people looking at your application will notice that as well. So yes, the 30 number is reality, but don't get too caught up in it. And 
you, as Dr. Bramman, were kind of alluded to this uh, quantity versus quality, when in reality, you need both. You need numbers, but you also need uh, stuff that is good work, stuff that you've put substantial time into and stuff that you can talk about in interviews and anyone on the street that asks you about anything on your application. Yeah, and, and it comes down to just finding something that you're passionate about, a project that you're passionate about. So like I said, I, you know, I wanted to go back to Africa at some point in my career. So one of the research that I'm passionate about is global neurosurgery. So, you know, I started doing some of the work even during my research here. Uh, so we did some papers, some uh, research. Uh, so, you know, I was passionate about that. And then during my interviews, I was able to really uh, sh show that passion through my, uh, my work. And that will go a long way because then people are like, well, not only does he know about his research, but he truly is passionate about it. And that's that goes a long way than just okay i just did 20 papers on something that i don't care about you know it won't come off genuine so. yeah absolutely all excellent points about kind of the the, the research um you know the research rat race it, it's getting more and more uh you know it's a hot topic in neurosurgery and, and education in neurosurgery and you know it can be it can be intimidating but you know those are also averages i know of a do student that matched that had two publications going in and he matched uh so you know those are things to consider as well um but yeah it's it's very difficult to balance but it's i i have faith in you so you know Talk, we've talked about research. We've talked about grades. You know, Dr. Barrymore, as you progress through, you know, your preclinical years and you did really well on your rotations, now upcoming is audition rotation season and sub eyes. And I know that you are a legend at some places, so I've heard on the sub eye trail. And so what are some considerations or things that you took into account when you were going on your sub I and audition trail uh, during your fourth year? So for sub I's, this is your opportunity to show the program how good you are, who you are, and to set yourself apart from other people. And also just to show that, okay, well, you know, um, what I, you separate yourself from the paper, essentially, from the paper you, and now this is the real you. So my philosophy was always, um, be the first to get there, the last to leave. Sometimes don't leave. Um, so uh, you you want to show that you have very good work ethic, um, that you're always available, you know, the three three or four A's, available, affable, and um, I always forget the last one. Able. able. Yep. So um, you always want to show that, you know, I'm always around, I'm always willing to work, no matter what it takes. Um, you know, I remember there was a time that I was in my sub and I sit in the hospital for three days straight. Um, three days straight. But, but the thing is, the idea behind it wasn't because I was trying to, uh, it was just me. I was the only medical student. So I wasn't trying to outshine anyone. But it was just like, okay, well, I'm really dedicated to this work. And I really wanted to show myself how much I truly loved it and how much I was willing to give for it uh, when it came, came down to it. Um, and then I think a couple more advice is be a good person. Uh, I know sometimes you you have to rotate with two or three or four other medical students and you're trying to show that you're better or in some way you, you wanna set yourself apart, but that sometimes can, the process of trying to do that can hurt you more than it'll help you. So sometimes it's better just to try to be, if you, if you have to show someone out or if you have to, uh, you know, be a bad person just to show you that you're good. It's not, it's not, it's not the best route to go. Um, rather, just you know, stay leveled, stay calm, be yourself, uh, do the best that you can do. Everything else will come you know, uh, through it. So I know, like, I had a couple of rotations where I was the only medical students. In those cases, then I knew, okay, I don't have anyone to compete with, but myself. So. I'm going to do whatever I can to make myself look good and set myself apart. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And then just a follow up question too: when you were applying for certain places, were there any considerations or things to take into account with being a DO? Uh, for like for sub eyes? Yes. Oh yeah. Um, so you want to choose your sites very carefully, 
right? Uh, you just don't want to choose any sites uh, because some each opportunity you get to do a sub eye, that's a place that could potentially take you. So you don't want to go somewhere where they're most likely not going to take you. Uh, you want to be realistic with your credentials, with your application. So the places that I chose, I knew that I had a realistic chance of getting there or getting picked at that program. Uh, so you, the entire thing has to be strategic. There's nothing about the entire process. It's just, oh, I'm just going to willy nilly just go through it and see what happens. You have to plan it out from like now, if you're a third year going into your fourth year. Okay, these are the rotations I want to do. This is what I want to show when I get there. This is what kind of letters I want to get. This is the kind of people that I want to meet. Um, when you're in the OR, you have to constantly listen um, more than you talk uh, because you never know uh, what conversations might be had and that you could you know, contribute to at another spot to, you know, um, to set yourself apart. I don't know if that's a better way to put it. Um, just, yeah, just, just a lot of different things to, to, to consider. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a, you know, a great answer. And that's exactly what I was looking for is that, you know, as a DO, you do have to take some things into consideration as you're looking at your sub I sites. Um, for medical students that are third years that are looking into their fourth year, um, there, when you are a DO student, you list your osteopathic status. There are some places that just do not take DO students. Um, I don't agree with it. I think I don't, you know, personally, I don't agree with it, but it's, it's a reality. And so, uh, you know, the saying, putting your eggs into a basket. Well, I like to do a derivation of that is putting your eggs into a basket that's open for you. Go to a place that they are genuinely interested in having you, genuinely interested in wanting to get to know you and potentially match you as a resident. You don't want to try to force yourself into a place that they aren't interested in you. You know, you don't want to wait. You don't want to use all that time and all that effort and all that energy into a place that might not, you know, take you because of your credentials. And it's unfortunate, but it's just a reality. Um, you know, that was one of the criteria that I looked at when I was not only looking for sub eyes, but also just research endeavors in general, you know, getting mentors at places that have matched DOs or are open to DOs. It's huge because then they see, well, this person is, you know, we don't care what letters are after their name. This person works hard. This person is, you know, passionate about what they want to do in neurosurgery and, you know, they could be a potentially really good fit at our program. So that is definitely something to take into consideration as you're doing your sub eyes. And, and, and like Dr. Bamamore said, you need those three A's, you know, affable, able, you know, available. They're all huge. Um, you have to be well liked. You have to be, you know, you don't need to know every question that the surgeon asks you, um, but you need to have the basic understandings. And, you know, if you miss a question, just come back the next day and know it. Um, and, you know, Dr. Bama Moore is the epitome of available. I mean, the guy spent, you know, three days in the hospital. Uh, I mean, I don't think you can get more available than that. So, uh, you know, while I, you don't have to spend three days, definitely be around and don't be looking at the clock and don't be showing up 20 minutes late into rounds, you know, show that you're able to get there and, and be around and be there for cases and just, you know, participate in, in your, in your rotations. Uh, you know, Gretchen, you, you're entering your fourth year, but are a lot of those tenants the same as you did your third year rotation in neurosurgery as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, one in particular, I mean, especially as a third year, I mean, they're not expecting a ton from you knowledge, wise like neurosurgical knowledge, very basic, but what they are looking for is, is this person showing up on time? Are they showing up early? Do they want to be there? Um, these faculty and OR staff, they've been around tons and tons of students throughout the years, and they can tell when a student truly wants to be there and who's just along for the ride and is counting down the days till the end of the rotation. So um, be what I like to think about is be productive within your capacity. Like if you're a third year med student, then think of everything that you know how to do and like that could be helpful and not disruptive or anything like that. And ask ask the OR nurse like, hey, could, do you mind if I do this today? Or can you show me how to put in this fully so maybe I can do it tomorrow? And um, people want to say yes to you um, with a lot of different things. If they, if they trust you and if they see you have the capacity 
to do so. Like they want to say yes, they want to help you thrive. Um, so those are just kind of some tenants that I've um, gotten from third year. I imagine for a fourth year and sub eyes especially, it'll just kind of be the more extreme of that. There'll be a little bit more expectation. Um, and but I mean, kind of all the same thing, work hard, be there, show that you want to be there, um, ask questions when appropriate, when the timing is right, you know, not in the middle of clipping of an aneurysm or something like that. But um, yeah, just let people know you're excited and they'll be way more apt to let you help, let you hold something during surgery if they know you're excited to be there and that you want to learn. Absolutely. Such a great, great insight, you know, that you and great mindset to take into all your rotations and especially going into fourth year with your sub eyes and, you know, just being present and being, you know, helpful to your capacity. I think that some people, you know, think that they're not, you know, they need to be the ones that are putting in the pedicle screws their third year, or the ones that are, you know, get, getting their hands dirty. And it's like, no, you, you need to go through the steps, the baby steps to learn, help within your capacity, pull drains, things like that. So, mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, one kind of final question, and we've touched on this a little bit with research years, but to just encompass this into one topic, um, you know, being a DO, and I, I before I even do that, I just want to list some some statistics. These are from the uh, charting outcomes in the MASH from 2022. And for those of you who don't know who the, what this is, this is a book that essentially lists all the different statistics uh, for matched and unmatched applicants that are IMG, DO, or IMG is International Medical Graduate, DO and MD students. And looking at the neurosurgery ones from 2022, um, there were only 21 total applicants um, that applied with nine total matching. And that is the best year that the DO, that DO students have ever had. In comparison to MDs, the matches were 202 out of 272. So a large difference, a lot more applicants, a lot of really, you know, all of them are qualified, incredible applicants. So you know, and board scores were very good. Abstracts, presentations, publications are 30 plus, uh, you know, and for MDs, they're about 25 and a half. So very close there. So, you know, I want to pose the question to Dr. Bamamore. Um, you know, how do you stand out in, in such a, a, a large competitive field as a DO with such incredible students from all across the country? What may, how do you stand out in the crowd in a good way? Very hard. But I think what helps is just trying to be the best version of yourself. Um, you know, you know the stats. These are the things you need to get there, right? So try your best to meet those stats. And then uh, the, the qualities that best, uh, that, that best amplifies you, use them to your advantage, right? Um, for me, I knew that I was very, very good when it came down to my sub eyes. So I took every advantage as I could with my sub eyes to make myself look good. Um, the research opportunities that I had at Mayo, I knew that they, and being someone who worked at, you know, Mayo is a big name. So, you know, that's something that you can also use to your advantage in a way. I mean, you're doing good work, but you want to make yourself, you want to be the best, you want to be the your your own best salesman. A lot of a lot of us tend to not want to be outspoken about how good we think we are because you think it's vain. But when it comes down to this, you really have to just by using every opportunity that you have, like you said, Taylor, uh, social media, uh, Twitter, Instagram. Um, the reason why I post whenever I publish a paper, I always post it on social media. It's not because I want to show the world that oh I just publish a paper. It's just because you never know who's going to see this and say, oh, wow, that's amazing. Uh, I have this opportunity for you. Do you want to collaborate on this? And then before you know it, you're working on really groundbreaking work. Um, so I think, you know, it's hard to really stand out, but the people that do stand out, they just put their best foot forward and they're not afraid to be the best versions of themselves. So I think that's, other than that, I don't really understand anything else to add. So, yeah. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I would just add this. Your DO, it doesn't matter what DO school you eventually go to. It's not impossible. It's hard, but it's not impossible. It doesn't mean the door is closed. It 
just means you just need to do a little bit of extra than everyone else. But it doesn't mean it's a, impossible. So. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. It, it might, you know, the door might be a little harder to open, but it's not closed permanently. And, you know, like you said, just getting involved in everything uh, and just, you know, being the best advocate you can for yourself as an applicant and a person is, is, is critical. And then, you know, Gretchen you, and, and Dr. Bamelmore did this as well, but you're in the midst of it, a research year. How do you feel a, a research year benefits a DO student as they're applying to neurosurgery? Yeah, for sure. Um, outside of the, you know, just getting more pubs and getting experience in research, um, you know, that aside, that's kind of given. Um, a main one, especially if you don't have a, a home neurosurgery residency program, a big one is just getting to know people at a place that does have a program. Um, whether that's your, definitely should be your PI, your mentor, but then um, they can usually set you up with other faculty within the department too, or just a meet and greet and or a chat over coffee. Just the more people that know your face, that know your story, and um, that just get to know, just are starting to get to know who you are. Like they want to see you thrive. They want to. They want you to succeed. Um, that's been my experience. Um, the institution I'm at right now has been really great um, as far as just like saying yes. You know welcoming me with open arms, just like letting me know, you know, opportunities left and right, which is great. Um, but then I think you also have to kind of going along with Dr. Bammermore said, you have to be ready to put your best foot forward. So you have to be prepared um, for those type of engagements and chats with people. But then um, you also have to be willing to kind of go outside your comfort zone too. Um, one thing, this has been a big one for me, but the way I kind of talk myself through it is if someone is say like giving you this opportunity or asking if you would want to do this A, B, and C, it's because they probably think you can do it. You know, within reason, they're not a faculty neurosurgeon's not gonna hand you the drill, you know, um, if they don't think you can do it or do it under their guidance. Or I mean, that's an extreme example, but. Um, no one is going to give you something where they think you're going to fail. Um, they are going to give you what they think you can handle and just being ready to dive in and say yes and do it, I think is a big mental thing to kind of get straight. Yeah, absolutely. All, you know, great advice and just, you know, the research years are becoming more and more popular and you know, mm -hmm. I see more and more people doing them and, and they're, they're proving to just, you know, be worth their weight in gold as those applicants enter, you know, their, their application year. So, you know, I want to take a couple questions from the chat here really quickly. Um, you know, Muhammad asked a question um, about being an IMG um, and I don't have any personal experience of that. So, but we'll definitely have an episode on being an IMG and pursuing neurosurgery in the future. But one that I want to pose here that he had um, is, you know, we're talking about all these publications, you know, isn't it pretty hard to do this? And, you know, do all of these have to be in clinical neuroscience, neurosurgery, neurology? Um, yeah, they don't all have to be in clinical stuff. Uh, you can do basic science too. It all comes down to what really your interest is. But yeah, it is hard to get these through in medical school. Um, I know, <clears throat> I know, I, I know a couple of people that, uh, when, <clears throat> once they get the opportunity to have a plug into an institution that can help them with research, they just always made sure that they had about one to two projects at any given time that they were working on. So if you start in the first year of medical school, let's say that you have a clinical paper that you work on every few months, it's not unreasonable that even if you don't take a research year that you could end up with more than 10 to 15 papers by the time you apply to you know, uh, residency. Um, it really just comes down to finding an opportunity and just uh, and then making sure that you're able to leave, live up that expectations. And the people that can't do it during medical during the medical school years, then, you know, you have to think, OK, well, does a research year would the research year benefit me? Um, and in some in most cases, it does, because it's, I think it's become more of the norm than not nowadays, because then you get the opportunity to do research. and get research out in that one year and you go back to medical school and then you're ready to apply. So it really comes down to you. 
Yeah, yeah for sure. I remember, you know, it, it, it comes down to a lot of time management really is how I, I got a lot of mine. It was, yeah, I, I might not have been able to, you know, uh, you know, play video games for a couple of hours after, you know, re, you know, relaxing one night, or I couldn't go out with my friends or I couldn't see, you know, my family for a weekend or whatever. But sometimes there's a little bit of sacrifice that's involved. And if you manage your time, well, you should be able to do a lot of, of both of them at the same time. But, you know, really managing your time and, you know, taking the data that you have and really, you know, maybe if you have a large data set, making two papers out of it, or, you know, submitting those to two conferences, and then presenting two posters. That's how a lot of these numbers are gotten is, is, is just taking what you have and using it to your best advantage, and sometimes not publishing one giant data set in one paper, you want to be able to, you know, take it to double ANS or CNS or your local conference or, you know, whatever it may be to really get those numbers up. But again, it's a balance of, you know, numbers aren't everything you want to make sure that it's quality research, you want to make sure that you're you know what you're talking about and it's and it's you know contributing to the scientific literature so that's that's um what i would say and then no i have a couple of publications in in med ed um that i really enjoy and i'm passionate about so it's they don't have to be all in clinical neurosciences i think it would be a little you know concerning if you came in with you know 30 papers in OBGYN uh to apply to neurosurgery residency but again you know if you uh, you know some research neurosurgery research is at the top some research is in the middle and then no research is at the bottom so you need you know it's okay if you have a little bit uh, in another field but you want to make sure that you're getting some in uh neurosurgery before you apply so um and then one more you know another question here i see in the chat um you know, John says showing dedication is huge, right? So is it enough to only use one of your third year electives for neurosurgery? Or do you guys think you should do more than one? Or how do you think you should best prepare yourself going into fourth year? That's a good question. Um, I'll just, I guess, give a, an anecdotal experience for this one. So, um, for me, my third year neurosurgery elective was not so much to prepare me for neurosurgery. It was more to see if I can survive the neurosurgery life or if I could see myself actually doing this in the future. Because really, you know, that's what your fourth year is for you to, you know, really put yourself into it. And because you've already decided at that point you want to do neurosurgery, right? So, um, so you know, I don't think your third year will help you to decide. It will just help you to decide, okay, is this for me or not? That was the way I looked at it, um, and I realized that it was from for me after that third year. And they won't ex they don't expect a lot out of you as a third year medical student. You really don't know anything. Um, now that I think about it, yeah, you, you really don't know anything as a third year medical student. So they they won't expect too much out of you uh, unless you really show your interest, and that could also help too, because then they can notice how well you work, and that can set you up for more opportunities in the future. Uh, so yeah, they don't expect a lot out of you, but you can always show up. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, as far as like, is it enough to only use one? Uh, I guess that's kind of school uh, dependent on your school and what they allow you to do. Um, for myself, as an as an example, um, I only had two actual electives that I got to pick for third year. And uh, they had to be different. You couldn't do them in like the same specialty. So I only had one uh, neurosurgery rotation during my third year. And uh, as Dr. Bama Moore has said, um, I used that month at the, I mean, it was, it was my last month of third year. So I kind of had an idea that neurosurgery is what I wanted because nothing else really stuck uh, the rest of the year. But um, that's ma mainly a month to decide like is this am i moving forward with this or not because seven years is a long time and if you can figure out in one month that it's not for you then it's probably best to move on to a different specialty and find something you are more passionate about but um so i'd say one is fine if that's all you have then one is one and you take that with what you can get and make the most of it yeah, for sure. It's a, a common theme amongst, uh, you know, all of us here is that we kind of use that 
that one rotation that we had to really see number one, is it what I wanted to do? Did it confirm what I wanted to pursue? But also like Dr. Bamamore said, is this the life that I, you know, really want, you know, going in early, staying late every single day for a month and, you know, thinking about, wow, could I do this, do this for seven years? And then when you kind of have that aha moment where you're, you know, you're, you're in the OR and you're like, wow, it's been 13 hours. That's uh that's weird. It, you know, it's kind of like it, it, it it solidified it for me. That's what I wanted to do. So I think one rotation is is more than enough to kind of answer that question for you and kind of get you set up. And and like they like everyone said, your expectations as a third year med student aren't incredibly high. But if you show your interest, you might be able to do more than the average med student that rotates through the neurosurgery department. Um, so that would that that'd be our advice. Um, so. Yeah, I don't see any more questions in the chat. So I guess we can, you know, wrap it up here. You know, Dr. Bamamore, do you have any final, you know, words of advice or anything for our, you know, our DOs in, in the chat and watching at home in their pursuits of neurosurgery? Um, yeah. Um, I think through whatever you're doing, always know. Uh, this is just like something that I always carry along with me. Know that there is always very high eyes and then there's always very low lows. So you're always going to be at a point where you're at your most eye. Do not let it get to your head. Um, there's always going to be at the time that you're at your lowest low. Also, don't let it get to your head. Um, you always want to keep a nice balance. Um, so when life gets hard, just know it's going to come to an end at some point. When life gets good, just know it's going to come to an end at some point. So that always gets you like, okay, more humbled so that way you don't feel too, you know, oh, I'm better than everyone else or, oh, I suck and I, everything, I'm the the world's dumbest idiot, whatever you think that, is, that might be. But um, so I think that simple philosophy will get you through like some of the hardest things. I, you know, I feel like not matching it to neurosurgery uh, is one of the hardest feeling you could ever go through because you feel like you've given your all and then now you're you don't have anywhere to go to so um that can teach you a lot of things like humility uh how to get knocked down and get back up uh that goes a long way um so i took it as okay well this is a challenge um i just got knocked knocked down okay let's see what i can do to get myself back up um so yeah. So if you, you know, if you, if anyone ever goes through that, don't, it's not the end of the world, essentially. So just keep it, keep, keep going one step at a time. Um, keep, stay in the middle. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. And that, you know, your resilience, your grit, your humility, everything about you has led to you and, and your success is, you know, gaining that entrance into, into residency. And you're really a role model uh, for myself and, and a lot of other people out there. So, you know, you really are making an impact on a lot of people's lives. So well, we just want to thank you for, you know, taking your time, you know, you giving your time to us and giving your insights and your wisdom into the process. I know that we all greatly appreciate it. So that is going to, uh, you know, wrap up uh, this episode of the Neurosurgery Journey podcast. And I hope everyone at home um, enjoyed this episode and we will uh, see you next week.